Ladies and gentlemen, we have with us today, Mr. Nick Ligo Baker, CEO Paradigm CX, who would be sharing his expertise on five listening posts of CX measurement and why one view is not enough to get a holistic understanding of your CX. Nick specializes in setting and then operationalizing CX strategy, applying customer experience research by, de by delivering VOC, mystery shopping and journey mapping solutions. For over 17 years, Nick has helped organizations improve their performance by understanding and acting on insights. Nick's experience extends across multiple sectors, driving engagement across all customer touch points, including contact centers, stores, and head office functions. Over to you, Nick. Brilliant, thank you very much for such a nice introduction. So bear with me, I shall just share my screen. Hopefully everyone can see that. Wonderful. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining me this morning. And uh, for me, yeah, now, the best companies in the world make experiences feel fast, effortless, and when it matters most, feel human too. But we live in a world of individuated consumption, a world where customers can interact with companies wherever and whenever they want. And as a result, it's much harder for organisations to track every engagement. There are many more touch points than companies would ever have previously envisaged. And as a result, an explosion of data. So to truly understand their customers, organizations need to first capture this data, understand it correctly, and then leverage it to create these fast, effortless and human based experiences consistently every time. This should create value and benefits to customers, employees, and in return, fuel the growth of the organization itself. However, the organizations uh, seeing the whole picture uh, through those C CX measures um, need to really consider how they do that. So as has already been introduced, I'm Nick Ligo Baker from Paradigm CX. So a UK based customer experience strategy and measurement company. By helping organizations measure the business effectively, I've enabled leaders to understand their customers, their people, and their business purpose just a little bit better. And in doing so, I continue to help organizations engage with their employees to create a CX culture that makes it easy for customers to do business with them. Today, I'm gonna to discuss the five listening posts of CX measurement and why one view is not enough to enable organizations to get a holistic understanding of their customer experience. Organizations have measurement programs. They have the desire to understand how to improve their business. They buy measurement solutions to capture feedback, sometimes extremely expensive solutions with really clever analytic systems. They make changes in the business, but yet they keep seeing the same messages being returned through these measurements. Why might this be happening? Are the, mes are the messages wrong? Well, no, not always. As the famous physicist Albert Einstein once said, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome. By only adopting one type of measurement, businesses might not be able to identify these key insights, the insights that are required for them to introduce meaningful change and to see an uplift in performance improvement. So I'm gonna start with a definition. What is customer experience? So I thought I'd share my definition of CX as a way of framing the scope and purpose. So customer experience is a dynamic combination of conscious and subconscious emotions, resulting in the perception a person has about an organization or a brand, including the influences that an organization, its people, its products, and its digital technology has on every touch point that a person experiences, triggering a memory over time. Now, when you begin to understand what we mean by experience, we can then speak seek to measure and then manage the experience more deliberately. We do this by applying a set of practices and tools in order for organizations to set and meet its customers' expectations. Customer experience is not just about process. There are numbers, numerous cases of organizations using metrics to you know, base decisions that can be completely wrong. And the main error is often measuring the wrong things in the wrong way or a combination of both. Therefore, basing decisions on DUF data 
And for example, you know, sometimes data correlates, but it's not necessarily linked or indeed relevant to the purpose of the business and the desired outcomes. Measurement has to have a purpose. But my key response to that is insight without data is just opinion. And there needs to be validation in order to provide reliable fact-based evidence to make decisions. Now, I'm not talking about a simple $10 refund. I'm talking about the big decisions, the ones which can cost an organization its reputation or even its future survival. But equally, not all people experience the same event in the same way. So understanding people is tricky, right? This is why there has to be a combination of measures to get the full picture. Most organizations will use one or maybe two measures, but for me, there are five required to cover all bases, but what are they and how can they be used to build a holistic view of the business? Hopefully that stays. Most will have heard of customer feedback or voice of customer measurement. Listening to what customers have to say through surveys, their actions, habits, their complaints. And I list these elements as they are often dis a disconnect, even with voice of customer measurement itself. Now, voice of customer can be split into two key types, transactional and relational. As they suggest, they measure a transaction and also the overall relationship status between a customer and a company. And it's vital to align this measure with other parts of an organization. Map the customer journey, then pick the most critical customer touch points, which have an influence on their propensity to buy and on their path to purchase. Whilst customers are happy to help, they're also time poor and won't continue to share if they're overburdened and if there's no sign of change on the back of their opinions being shared. Optimizing responses is still simple. The channel a customer most engages with is likely to be their preferred contact method. By adapting to meet this simple principle, companies will be able to achieve their optimal response rate. But, re but remember, people respond differently depending on the way feedback is given. The written word is very different to a voice message or an interview. And people will always give a moderated answer. And in the case of a transactional survey, this degrades the longer it is away from the moment of truth or when the transaction happened. There must be a commitment from the company to act upon the feedback that they receive. These key nuggets of information are too often kept from the broader business, as this is seen as power by those who have the information. And so a cultural war begins. Organisations need to have a clear purpose for feedback working collaboratively with each other across their teams to ensure that this is focused on the critical touch points and ask the right questions of the customer in the first place. <clears throat> now, this is seemingly difficult to achieve for a lot of organizations, but simply sharing insights freely and encouraging ownership of the outcomes, employees can learn and improve whether, you know, and make sure that the feedback is relational or transactional and irrespective of the channel it's received, are able to do something with it. Now, of course, current thinking suggests that structured surveys are limiting, which of course they are. Yeah, they're a guided response along the path of questions with pre-coded responses. However, unstructured data is also perceived as hit and miss, where the validity of any single theme, even with AI and machine learning, is difficult to prove reliably. The technology isn't quite there yet to overcome this weakness, but it won't be long before this improves. Our customers would not be served without committed employees, those amazing people who hold a font of knowledge, which is too often untapped in the traditional annual employee survey. Now, when I speak about voice of employee, of course, I don't mean this type of annual survey. You know, the ones which ask you for your, you know, if you like your benefits or if you get paid enough. Yet yeah, we all know the answers to those questions. I'm referring to an employee survey, which is in parallel. which is in parallel to the customer survey, following the same journey and asking employees to understand their role in that journey through the eyes of the customer. This allows the employee to identify elements which can be improved, whether this is policy, process or product innovation. For me, it's vital that employees understand the company purpose. And when they do, they can help identify the gaps in the business thinking, how it impacts the customer expectations 
and it helps improve the company and its staff morale. By working to close those gaps, companies will be improving the service they provide to customers, as well as enriching the lives of their employees and being able to deliver to those customers. I'd like to point out that those companies I have worked with usually limit their thinking on this to the store staff only, those who deal with customers directly. But in doing so, they forget that everybody in the organization will have an indirect impact on the customer outcome, whether this is a speed of response, cost efficiencies, or directly in the product quality and the solution provided. But consistency is a challenge. Not all employees will get it. So how can we help measure this? And how do we understand how it's translated to the customer experience and outcome? This is where the voice of service comes into play. How can we measure the consistency of our performance in order to flatten out the feedback from our customers and employees to the things that matter most? Here is where mystery shopping works perfectly. By mirroring genuine personas and scenarios, we can imitate the typical engagement and measure how effectively training and coaching is being translated into the customer experience. It's activation onto the shop floor, if you like. There are typically two types of mystery shopping approach. A large panel of genuine customers or a small panel of highly trained auditors. Both have their merits and can be deployed to meet specific requirements. For example, in a business to consumer or a direct to consumer model, these may large, use a large panel of profiled customers, whereas in a B2B model, it's more likely that it's compliance driven and therefore a small panel of auditors is likely to succeed. And this could be whether you're looking at a finance application, such as a mortgage application, where there's much more detail that needs to be captured. This is a key component in closing the gap between the customer experience feedback and the observations from those employees delivering that experience. If we're unable to deliver with consistency, then it makes it very difficult to be confident in the measurement and understanding that that is equal across all of the relevant customer touch points in an organization. Although over time, the traditional fight for budget between voice of customer and mystery shopping has subsided as general appreciation from organizations now is to adopt both measurements to see greater benefit versus those who just operate the one customer measure. An example of this is hospitality sector. A client of mine would set out their brand standards, train their staff. They would then measure this through mystery shopping until they felt that they had good consistency across the board. They would then switch their insight budget to a voice of customer program. And this continued until they felt disillusioned with the voice of customer program, complaining that it wasn't representative of the training that they were giving. They would then switch back to mystery shopping to improve the consistency of their delivery. Of course, each time, the opportunity to connect the training with the customer experience and measure the two in panel parallel was lost. But once they'd done this, they were able to identify gaps in service, train them quickly and test continually. And this increased customer frequency, average spend per customer, and actually resulted in a 4% year-on-year revenue growth. And this is compared to a 1.5 or maybe 2% growth that they would have seen by just adopting one of those measures at a time. So whilst there was a small investment to have both programs running in parallel, there was a lot that they could then get back and the speed with which they could make change was far faster. And whilst we're talking 4%, this is a lot of cash when you're looking at a business that turns over 500 million a year. All companies have a process. It's an unavoidable fact of doing anything, whether you're a solo entrepreneur doing your thing your way or a large global corporation with set processes. There will be a supply chain, people policies, customer journeys, payments, you name it, processes are everywhere. As companies get bigger, they bring in leaders to own each process, operations director, supply chain director, marketing director, HR, finance, etc. all process leaders. So there's no surprise when organizations then measure their processes to see how they're performing. Most performance growth is typically measured against the last year's performance with reflecting month to month or maybe this week last year as a comparable. And this is a very inside in way of measuring performance. 
This is only exacerbated by organisations who then create KPIs on these processes, setting targets for their staff against them. We all know that the measurement has a lag. For example, if a food supply chain had a fault in production today, when tomorrow arrives, there's an impact on the customer. And of course, we only find out from the contact center when a complaint is received. In the next process meeting, the issue might be discussed, updates shared, and any fixes implemented. Leaders are happy because the business carries on as normal. But why is this? Is this really good enough? Is this the right type of thinking process that we should be thinking about when we're creating them? In this scenario, the problem is only fixed as a result of a customer, dis customer discontent and a complaint. But the opportunity was to consider the outcome at the point of the process failure, therefore avoiding the customer discontent. And this happens because the customer is not the client of the supply chain process. But what if the process measurement was re-engineered to be inside, sorry, outside in? What if this was used as a way for organizations to learn about their impact on the customer outcomes? And then for companies to use this learning, not only to warn customers of impending disruption, but to prevent it from happening in the first place. By adjusting the focus of the process measurement to focus on the impact on the customer outcome, there's a more proactive approach to minimizing the disruption to the customer. The process owners understand it in advance, what will happen, and what steps can be taken to recover situations before they escalate with customers. Even when a situation cannot be stopped, there is an opportunity to proactively recover the customer through communication and action in the best interest of the customer, and ultimately, therefore, protects the relationship with the business and the company. So I'll come on to the last measure, and understanding the trends in the market you operate in is as important as listening to your customers' employees. Now, why do I say this? Well, whilst we're all competing for share of wallet, we're also seeking to fulfill the needs of our customers. Most growth strategies start with increasing the share of spend through increased frequency and volume of sales. You have to fend off competition who might have a better product, maybe, might have a better price point, or who can make access to the product more convenient. But if you focus totally on customer and employee and business process only, there's a chance, just a chance, over time, your product or service will become less relevant. The customer needs my change, or worse still, disappear altogether. Now, I began my career in e-commerce as a supplier of music, film, and console games. And at the time, the product was physical, but the sales and distribution had evolved to be online. Yeah, personal and individual purchases. Just one year after I joined that company, I was involved in the digitization of music. And that was to help by providing short audio clips for songs so that when they were shown on the website, people could hear them before buying an album. Yeah, fantastic innovation. Really loved being part of that. Two years later, Apple launched the iPod. And the digitization of music moved from just clips to entire songs and albums. Physical product was on the decline and music and video games and retail industry was on its knees. And it started to change people's behavior. People didn't buy albums because they liked one song. They could now just buy that one song. So they were able to create eclectic mixes of audio, which was personal to them. Now, 15 years later, almost everyone has a smartphone, has the ability to stream music, film, games consoles now connect to an online service to host game rooms. This is not just a whistle stop tour of my career, but proof that if you don't remain relevant to your customers, you will become obsolete. The need they once had you know, is fulfilled through services that are different now. They're easier, more instant, personalized, and ultimately cheaper. Now, one of my clients during that time was a company called Love Film. They had a home delivery rental service for DVD and Blu-ray. Their response to the changing market was to collaborate with the film studios, not only to distribute their products, but to start digitizing them and streaming them. Now, a little company called Amazon, you may have heard of them, saw potential in this and bought them. And this created the foundation for Amazon Prime streaming service. Now, this adaptation to the market, while staying aware of the customer needs, ensured not only survival and growth of that company, but it meant the long-term success.
Now, there are many examples of markets almost disappearing as technology and customer behavior evolves. Music is one, cameras, digital cameras is another, because they're now in everybody's mobile phone, both of which are impacted by the development and capabilities of the smartphone, of course. But measuring the market helps organizations remain relevant, continue to provide value, and to meet the needs of the customer in the way that they choose. But having all the right measures still can't provide all of the answers. Now I've said throughout the presentation that there's a great importance in designing the measures together so that they can work in synergy and not against each other. However, there is still a need to get the right mix of data and to create the right balance of insight and action to enable the organization to thrive. Because ultimately, the whole reason for understanding customers and employees is to enable that business to grow and be successful. Consideration in the setup and components of CRM solutions can enable this data to further benefit the customer through personalized communication and engagements. And this is where the CX professionals really earn their worth. Through the alignment of prioritization and constant management required for an organization's people and customers to truly be in tune with each other. Now I liken this to a mixing desk because it's, these are the levers that are at the disposal of a CX professional to be able to dial up and dial down the different voices that they need in order to help the business steer and navigate its way through its market. Get this right and CX measures will deliver optimal outcomes for everybody involved on an ongoing basis. And that's really motivating for employees. It ensures happy customers and it leads to a growing and profitable organization. Thank you for your time today and thank you for listening.